Good morning. Would you please stand as the prayers will be led in this morning by drummer Connor Hughes and fifist Logan Primrose. Thank you. You may be seated. Connor and Logan, thank you, men. It was much symbolic of the day and time in which this country was founded that Fifus and drummers led the parade of those volunteers as they would go into battle. So we thank you for your willingness to help remind us of what it was like at a different time and era in which we live. And if y'all would like to step over there with Commissioner Hughes, there's a couple of chairs there. You're welcome to do that. <laughs> this day has been set aside by an executive order decades and decades ago to celebrate the heritage that we as a people enjoy your freedoms and liberties today. We have the privilege to assemble ourselves this morning under the leadership of the local ministerial alliance. A little bit different twist is being taken on our ceremony for praying for our nation. That was the foundation upon which the forefathers established this country. It's the foundation upon which God says in 2 Chronicles 7.14 If, with the condition, then, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal the land. We will begin with Samuel Huntington, who is being portrayed by Ken DeRuin. I'm sorry, Virginia, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, thank you. It was the biggest, boldest portion of the uh, agenda. Thank you, Virginia. I was about to get ahead of myself, but it's only appropriate that we recall the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, which was penned by Francis Scott Key. We learned that particular song in elementary school. This morning, Joan Estes will begin our ceremonies with that. Joan, would you come up?
junk. As we welcome each of these and we reflect upon our nation, the foundations upon which it was established, and the privileges that we enjoy today, would you join each of these who offers a prayer in behalf of one who may have prayed a prayer exactly, if not from the heart, saying, for those of you who may recall Samuel Huntington, was one of several maverick public servants during his era. He's devoted nearly all of his life to public office. He became active with the Sons of Liberty in his state in 19, excuse me, in 1774 and was chosen to be a legislator for the course of his term of service as well as having served as governor of the state of Connecticut. He served two terms as president of the Congress during the important adoption of the Articles of Confederation. Pastor Ken DeRuin will come and bring a prayer symbolic of this particular signer of our declaration. Pastor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This prayer was given at the council chamber at New Haven on the 13th day of October, in the 13th year of the independence of the United States. And he voices his prayers thanking God earnestly, ministers and people of all denominations, with becoming devotion to assemble for divine and social worship, and with grateful hearts to acknowledge the divine goodness in the great and the distinguishing favors and blessed bestowed upon these United States. And the people of this state particular, for the continuation of the esteemable privileges of the gospel and the means of grace, the blessings of peace, and for the general health enjoyed, the supplies of the fruits of the earth, notwithstanding the harvest or in some measures diminished, and for all other innumerable favors and unmerit mercies conferred upon us from the fountain of all goodness. Also to offer up universal supplication and prayer to Almighty God, the Supreme Governor of the universe, the ruler of the kingdoms of men, that it may be graciously pleased him to shower divine blessings upon the people of these United States, disposing them in a yet unexampled manner, to unite in voluntary forming a solitary constitution, which shall best fulfill the purpose of civil government by securing the inalienable rights of individuals and removing oppression far from the earth and in promoting the prosperity and permanent happiness of the Union. Inspire all in civil administrations with wisdom and integrity. Abundantly bless the inhabitants of this state. Succeed a preached gospel and the means of grace and cause pure religion to flourish. Grant us health in all our dwellings continue peace to yield her increase and bless us in all our interests and concerns extend his mercies to all mankind expose the nations of the earth to universal peace and put a period to the calamities of war and cause the world to be filled with the knowledge and the glory of god forever amen Thank you, Pastor Ken. Representing Wentworth Cheswell from 18, excuse me, 1740 
6 to 1817 is when his life was lived out. Wentworth Cheswell was a teacher. He was also the first African American elected to public office, holding the office of Justice of the Peace. He became the first archaeologist in New Hampshire and established the first library in Newmarket, becoming the town historian. He stood with 162 men in Newmarket, New Hampshire, to oppose the British. Little was known about this particular portion of his activity, but he rode that night with Paul Revere. He took the northerly route. Paul Revere took the westerly route. And since the British eventually went west, this is the reason Wentworth Cheswell's ride did not become as famous. Nevertheless, he sounded the call. Offering the prayer of Wentworth Cheswell will be Pastor Calvin Harris. Good morning. I don't uh, particularly have a prayer uh, from the hand of the writing of Mr. Cheswell. I'm going to let the God of Mr. Cheswell and all of us guide and direct me this morning as I attempt to go before his throne of grace. Our Father and our God, that has been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, forever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. O eternal God, making prayer of all mankind, this again and in thy presence we assemble here this morning and we're here, Lord, to give thanks for all you've done, for what you're doing, all you're going to do. Thank you for our nation, all the liberties that we enjoy today. Thank you for our founding fathers. Thank you for the life of Mr. Cheswell and others and all of the sacrifices and the devotion that they gave, Lord, that we may enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy today. Lord, we realize that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Lord, help us to be people that have a heart and mind for your will, your word, and your way. Look upon us, Heavenly Father, as we strive to continue to walk in the path of righteousness. We pray, Heavenly Father, that for all of our officials, both local and uh, national, pray for our leaders, asking Lord that you help them to make decisions to where we can lead quiet and peaceable lives with our thoughts upon thee. And oh Father, we just thank you not only for Mr. Cheswell and the, the other Cheswells, Heavenly Father, that have already gone on before us. Thank you for the chess wells that are in office today. We thank you for the future chess wells and others that will devote their lives to the Father to liberty and the cause of freedom. And Lord, we just ask that you bless our, our country in a special way. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. The famous forefather, Thomas Jefferson, practiced law, and as many of you may recall, he actually drafted the Declaration of Independence. Prior to serving as president, he was elected to the Congress and then eventually served as a commissioner and minister to France. His term serving as President of the United States was from 1801 to 1809. He was also instrumental in the founding of the University of Virginia. The prayer this morning was first delivered in Washington, D.C. on March 1st, excuse me, March 4th, 1801. Pastor Ross Shelton will bring that prayer on behalf of Thomas Jefferson this morning. Pastor. 
Prayer delivered by Thomas Jefferson. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable ministry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from the violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endow with thy spirit of wisdom those whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In times of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail, all of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I do not see Father Robert, Father Michael Strathers with us this morning, but I wish to read in behalf the portrayal of the Most Reverend John Carroll, who lived from 1735 to 1850. The Reverend John Carroll was the first Roman Catholic Bishop in the United States. He represented to Congress the need of a constitutional provision for the protection and maintenance of religious liberty, and doubtless to him, in part, is due the provision in the Constitution which declares that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. In common with their fellow citizens, the Catholics of the United States hailed with joy the election of George Washington as first president under the new Constitution. Before the inauguration, Bishop Carroll on behalf of the Catholic clergy, united with the representatives of the Catholic laity in an address of congratulations, admirable for its sentiments of exalted patriotism, the memorial and cordial reply of George Washington was to the Roman Catholics of the United States, in which he says, I presume that your fellow citizens will not forget the patriotic part which you took in the accomplishment of their revolution and the establishment of your government, or the important assistance which they received from a nation in which the Roman Catholic faith is professed. Commissioner Nash, would you join me here and lead us in the Lord's Prayer in behalf of the church? Let us pray, Lord pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to give us patience, but deliver us from evil. I apologize to Commissioner, he did not know that I was about to do that. So, thank you for your, your graciousness, Martin. It's interesting that the uh, Lord's Prayer is such a foundational prayer in our lives. As he is our founding father, it's, it would, would be George Washington. Sorry. The tall one. <laughs> Brian, I apologize for not having a bio of background. Would you come in behalf of Abraham Lincoln and share with us the prayer that you have prepared for us? It was Abraham Lincoln who um, first um, decided that there should be a day 
where our nation set aside to um, in humility uh, and in prayer, the way he put it. So what I wanted to do before I offered uh, a prayer of Abraham Lincoln is to read to you uh, the resolution that Lincoln uh, wrote uh, to set aside a national day of prayer. This is from March the 30th, 1863. Whereas the Senate of the United States devoutly recognizes the supreme authority and just government of the Almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations has, by a resolution requested the President to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humility. And whereas it is the duty of nations as well as men and women to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know that, by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjects to the punishments and chastisements in this world, may we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be put a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reform as a whole people, we have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request and fully concurring with the views of the Senate, I do by this proclamation designate and set apart Thursday, the 30th of May, 1863, as a national day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do thereby request the people of all, uh, the people of this nation to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respected homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. So the prayer that I'm about to read uh, is actually a prayer from Lincoln's second inaugural address, March the 4th, 1865. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, fondly do we hope and fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continues, until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid, another drawn with the sword. So still it must be said that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us set to the right, let us finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and for his orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and everlasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. We ask this in the name of the Almighty God. George Washington was the first president of this United States. He served from 1789 to 1797. He led the American victory over Great Britain in the American Revolutionary War 
as the commander in chief of the Continental Army from 1775 to 1783. He also presided over the writing of the Constitution in 1787. Washington became the first president by unanimous choice and oversaw the creation of a strong, well-financed national government that maintained neutrality in the wars which raged in Europe. This morning, offering a prayer in behalf of the leadership of George Washington is Pastor Troy Richardson. Pastor, would you come forward? I recently read a uh, book about George Washington and struck by his humility and his strong faith. And uh, this prayer is a prayer that was taken from his personal journal, his personal uh, journal, diary, and, uh, and I wanted to share it with you. It's a prayer for guidance. Let us pray. O eternal and everlasting God, I presume to present myself this morning before thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to accept of my humble and hearty thanks, that it hath pleased thy great goodness to keep and preserve me the night past from all the dangers poor mortals are subject to, and has given me sweet and pleasant sleep, whereby I find my body refreshed and comforted for performing the duties of this day, in which I beseech thee to defend me from all perils of body and soul. Increase my faith in the sweet promises of the gospel. Give me repentance from dead works, harden my wanderings, and direct my thoughts unto thyself, the God of my salvation. Teach me how to live in thy fear, labor in thy service, and ever to run in the ways of thy commandments. Make me always watchful over my heart, that neither the terrors of conscience, the loathing of holy duties, the love of sin, nor an unwillingness to, de to depart this life may cast me into a spiritual slumber, but daily frame me more and more into thy likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that living in thy fear and dying in thy favor, I may in thy appointed time attain the resurrection of the just unto eternal life. Bless my family, friends, and kindred. In thy Son's holy name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Reverend William Emerson Sr., which was the grandfather of the great Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson, was pastor of First Church Boston, and he used his pulpit to scold British injustices. On the morning of April 19, 1775, just as the sun rose, shots were fired between the British and the colonial militia on Lexington Green, which started the Revolutionary War. The outnumbered militia fell back that morning at Lexington, and the British pushed onward to Concord. Emerson penned these words, Let us stand our ground. If we die, let us die here. Chaplain Mike Manis, will come forward to bring Reverend William Emerson's prayer. Like a few of my brothers and peers, I do not could not find the prayer for him, and so I would like to place myself there on Concord that day as the British appeared. Let's let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're mindful of the tragedy at Lexington Green as the British came our is coming our way even now. Patriots on my right, patriots on my left, some young men and some old men like myself. We stand here to face the mighty British Empire that's come to take our freedoms and to take our liberties and to put the thumb of injustice straight down our throats. Dear Father, may we stand with courage to this awesome power that stands before us. May you be with our fledgling nation wherever it might be, however, however this day may turn out. 
And we pray, dear Father, that you would take our little country and bless it, that it might bless the world for liberty and justice and truth. Be with us today and grant us courage in this hour. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Ulysses S. Grant is a name that for Southerners is quite familiar. Possibly not as coveted as Robert E. Lee. However, a great man of God he was. He was the 18th president of this United States, serving from 1869 to 1877. Following his dominant role during the second half of the Civil War, Something worth noting is that as president, he enforced Reconstruction by enforcing civil rights and fighting Ku Klux Klan violence. Bringing Ulysses S. Grant's prayer this morning will be Pastor Clark Mahoney. Pastor. I have two proclamations I want to share with you from Ulysses S. Grant. The first one was given in 1871, and it says, the possession of seasons has again enabled a husbandman to garner the fruits of successful toil. Industry has been generally well rewarded. Awarded. We are at peace with all nations and tranquility, with few exceptions, prevails at home. Within the past year, we have in the main been free from the ills which have elsewhere affected our kind. If some of us have had calamities, there should be an occasion of sympathy with the sufferers, a resignation on their part to the will of the Most High, and of rejoicing to the many who have been more favored. I therefore recommend on Thursday, the 30th day of November next, the people meet in the prospective places of worship and there make the usual acknowledgments to Almighty God for the blessings He has conferred upon them, for their merciful exemptions from evil, and invoke His protection and kindness for their less fortunate brother, whom, in His wisdom, He has deemed it best to chastise. I witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington this 28th day of October in the year of the Lord, 1871, and the 96th year of the independence of the United States of America. President Ulysses S. Grant. Proclamation number two, the 229th proclamation, recommending religious services on July the 4th, 1876. It seems fitting that on the occurrence of the 100th anniversary of our existence as a nation, a grateful acknowledgement should be made to Almighty God for His protection and the bounties which he has graciously bestowed upon our beloved country. Done at the city of Washington this 26th day, June, A.D. 1876. Would you bow your heads with me just for a short prayer? Father, as we've listened to these prayers of our great leaders of the past, Lord, I think of the words in this proclamation the Lord, we gather in our usual places of worship. Lord, that was part of the early leaders of this great nation's life. They met with you on a regular basis to pray. And Father, we gather to get together this national day of prayer. And Father, we lift up in the name of Jesus. We lift up our leaders, Lord, uh, nationally and local leaders. We pray, dear God, your divine protection over them. That, Lord, you would lead and guide 
even right now, dear God, as we're entering into these very important elections. And Lord, this coming year into this coming November into these president this presidential election. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray that we would heed these prayers, that we would come to repentance, dear God. That we would realize the calamities that have has come upon us, dear God, has come from your hand. That we realize we need to repent and that we need to turn back to the God of our fathers. And Lord, I pray that in Jesus' holy name, we would restore this nation again. And Lord, right here in this beautiful, blessed place, this lovely courthouse in southeast Texas, dear God, you'd begin that work in each of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for our leaders. Thank you for our nation. Would you bless us and would you keep us with your almighty hand? And we pray that, Father, in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Alexander Campbell was an early leader in the Second Great Awakening. And the religious movements that had begun were out of this restoration movement. Several American churches traced their history to Alexander Campbell's leadership, including the Churches of Christ, the Christian churches, and the Churches of Christ, the Evangelical Christian Church in Canada, as well as the Christian Church, also known as Disciples of Christ. This morning, Reverend Michael Duncan Parrish will bring forth a reflection of Alexander Campbell's prayer. Campbell was, for a season, the editor of a periodical called the Millennial Harbinger. And in, that, and in his time as editor, he wrote uh, uh, several short sermons on practices of faith. And what I'm going to read this morning is an excerpt from the third short sermon on prayer. Now, i got to, of course, admit that <clears throat> A short sermon in 1839 is not exactly what we would call never mind <laughs> in the holy book we read be patient in affliction continue constant in prayer is any man afflicted let him pray rejoice evermore pray without ceasing pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit Two things are strongly suggested to us in these apostolic injunctions, the occasions and the seasons of prayer. Though intimately connected and sometimes confounded, the two are not identical. Occasions are incidents that call for anything to be done, and seasons are the times when it should be done. Among the occasions of prayer, afflictions are the most prominent. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, said David, the royal prophet, a royal poet. The prophet Hezekiah, in his afflictions, sought the Lord, and Jesus himself especially prayed in the scenes of darkness and distress through which he passed. Prayer, indeed, is the language, the natural expression of affliction and distress. And to have a tender-hearted, sympathizing friend to whom to flee in times of affliction is a consolation not to be expressed. Griefs and sorrows, if not divided, are diminished when uttered into the ears of a kind and sympathetic friend. When we come into the presence of him who pitieth us as a father pitieth his children, the belief that he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men is an alleviation, a comfort, not to be described. Is any man afflicted? Let him pray. Let him tell all his tale of woe and pour out his soul before God, who will certainly hear and succor and relieve him. For if God does not think it good to take away the affliction, he will at least enable him to endure it. 
but there are occasions of thanksgivings as well as of prayer. Favors received and blessings enjoyed call for thanksgiving to be prayerfully expressed. Therefore, said James, is anyone merry? Let him sing psalms. In everything, give thanks is a blissful precept. We may even in affliction thank the Lord on two accounts. First, that he treats us as sons and in, uh, in chastening us, and in the second place, that he has mingled so many blessings amid so much less chastisement than we deserve. There are seasons, times of prayer and thanksgiving as well as of petition and supplication. We may indeed convert particular times into occasions both of prayers and of thanksgiving. We may make the morning and the evening not only the seasons but the occasions of petition and praise. David sang, O Lord, in the morning I will direct my prayer to thee. I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. And the Levites were to stand every morning to thank and to praise the Lord, and likewise in the evening. God's people have always been a peculiar people, not like other people. They have made many occasions and seasons of devotion. David said, in the morning, in the evening, and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Daniel kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to God. But the apostles of Christ have taught us to pray always and to pray without ceasing. This denotes an habitual devotion, a constant communion with God. We are to make all important occasions seasons of peculiar devotion, and we are to make them the seasons themselves, morning, noon, and evening, occasions of prayer and thanksgiving. It is not a Pharisaic precision, or a sanctimoniousness at times and seasons, or a hypocritical exactness, but a, but a genuine, unaffected, cordial engagedness of soul on all important occasions and at regular seasons for which we plead as we see in the precepts and examples of the Holy Book. We need then to pray for the spirit of grace and the supplication and to cultivate a prayerful temper habitually and constantly, for without this it is impossible to enjoy Christian privileges. The stream of piety is a clear, constant, tranquil, swelling current that bears the soul nearer to the bosom of our Father and our God. And this part especially struck me. Say not, my Christian brother, you have not time for this. Say rather, you have not the disposition Say not that this will interfere with your business of life. Time is given you for no other purpose than to be saved. That is to be purified, sanctified, and fitted for heaven. And your daily and constant business is to give all diligence to make your calling and your election sure. Given by Alexander Campbell of Bethany, Virginia, July 1839. Will you pray with me, please? Lord God, help us to be before you constantly in our hearts and our minds. Help us to concentrate on your word and your will and your way, as Pastor Harris said. Help us, Lord God, be totally and completely yours. Fill us with your spirit as we know you have, and guide us in our everyday lives and living. Bring us to you as we pray in thanksgiving and in affliction. Bring us to you as we hold ourselves and our families and our communities and our nation and this world that we love so much.
before you, lifted up in prayer. We thank you, Lord God, for the gift of your Son, for the gift of our redemption, for the gift of our faith. And we ask you, Lord God, that you help us be a blessing and a gift to others. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Duncan. Before the last prayer is uh, offered, James Hale, would you come up and share the description of the flag that you described it to me that was added to our displays this morning? It seemed only beneficial for us to reflect upon that. Thank you, Judge Blanchett. Good morning. This morning I represent the uh, Vietnam Veterans Association, the Sons of the American Revolution, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. General Robert E. Lee is from Virginia. I've never been able yet to find any any comments or any books that, that spoke against him. He was an outstanding Christian man. He was against the, the war for secession, yet he sided with his home state of Virginia. He was number one at West Point, and he was an acquaintance of and good friends with all of those major generals, including Grant and Sherman, prior to the war. His wife designed this flag for his headquarters in the Army of Northern Virginia, and the canton with the field of stars is in the shape of the Ark of the Covenant. At this time, I would like uh, Sid Holt to come up. He's our, our camp chaplain here in Woodville. One thing about General Lee, at the end of the war, he was in a church one Sunday morning, and there was one black man in that, in that congregation that walked forward and knelt down at the altar. And not one person got up to kneel with him and said, General Lee. So that showed what kind of a man he was. He was heartbroken that, that we had to go to war in the first place. See? It is an honor to stand here before you this morning. An honor of General Robert E. Lee. I'm going to read a prayer from him. Knowing that intercessory prayer is our mightiest weapon and the supreme call for all Christians today, I pleadingly urge our people everywhere to pray, believing that prayer is the greatest contribution that our people can make in this critical hour. I humbly urge that we take time to pray, to really pray. Let there be prayer at sunup, at noonday, at sundown, at midnight, all through the day. Let us pray for our children, our youth, our aged, our pastors, our homes. Let us pray for our churches. Let us pray for ourselves that we may not lose the word concern out of our Christian vocabulary. Let us pray for our nation. Let us pray for those who have never known Jesus Christ and His redeeming love. For moral forces everywhere 
for our national leaders and let us prayer be our passion let prayer be our practice General Robert E. Lee thank you Commissioners, would you come stand with me, please? Representative Mike Hamilton, thank you for joining us this morning here in Tyler County. I would wish for each of you to know that as policy makers, as decision makers, as those who are charged and entrusted with the responsibility of levying tax upon our citizens, the five of us may not always agree. We may not always agree about decisions relative to hard choices that we have to make. But one thing I've noticed about this group of men is that they always agree to start every commissioner's court monthly meeting with prayer. So we do stand united in agreement of the most important thing in seeking wisdom and then courage to do what's right so it's a privilege to have these men to stand arm in arm with many of these that you've heard from this morning have voiced those prayers for wisdom and courage for the decisions that this court makes in behalf of the good for the whole Prayer is the foundation. A nation's greatest source is its people. A nation's greatest source of its people is their God. And our God is all powerful, ever present, and all knowing. On behalf of all of us, who fill these positions of public service to each of you. We extend a thank you to the Ministerial Alliance and to each of you who stand in your pulpits and proclaim righteousness and justice. For well, that's the foundation upon which a peaceful nation and a community enjoys its privileges. May God continue to bless America as America seeks to bless God. Thank you. Pastor Keith Bellamy has asked me to lead this song. Uh, they don't get enough of me being the song leader in the Lions Club. I do want to tell you that this song was written by a Russian immigrant, uh, Irving Berlin, in 1917. He did not use the song. In 1941, I believe it was, uh, uh, Kate Smith wanted a song to help lift the spirits of America, and she asked her in Berlin if he had one, and he said, well, yeah, I have this thing stored away in the trunk. And he gave her the song and the rights to it. And she started singing it, it became immensely popular, and she took it back to him and said, Irving, I cannot do this. I can't, this is too much. I mean, the song is making a bundle. And so together, they gave the song and the rights to the Boy and Girl Scouts of America. So, uh, if you will stand, please. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, light with foam. America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Thank you.
reckon they heard that in Beaumont. Huh? <laughs> Thank y'all for being here. Thank you, Virginia Haynes, for going.